my talk today is about alpine dynamics uh, under different climate change scenarios and what it means for ecological restoration. So the background that you can see here is actually one of the areas that I uh, work at. So this is the Andean Paramo in the tropical pine Andes in, in Colombia. And you can see that it's quite a unique ecosystem. Um, it's a landscape that is dominated by grasses, but at the same time, it has a very strong presence of giant rosette species that are asteraceae and it's quite extreme conditions in terms of uh, soils and especially climates. I'm trying to, yeah. So just a um, reminder, today we are going to talk about mountains. So I wanted just to uh, remind everyone why mountains are important in the world. So mountains are usually very unique environments. They do present a very high alpha diversity and beta diversity at the same time. The very small surface, you are going to find many species organized in many different ecosystems. So these are definitely interesting ecosystems to conserve and uh, to manage because um, the biodiversity you do find in mountains you don't find anywhere else. I would like to point, yeah, that this is the pointer. So mountains in general are almost always found in areas of the globe where you do have high biodiversity. Here you can see a map of the biggest diversity zones. So this is gamma diversity. And you can see that several mountains actually coincide with the areas with most species. For example, we have the Andes around here. We have the Himalayas around here. Uh, then we have Papua New Guinea. Obviously, the tropical mountain areas are a little bit more diverse than the temperate ones, but overall, we do see very high biodiversity. In addition, we also see important ecosystem services. Now, a mountain, as all of you know, uh, contains both forests, drylands, deserts, and grassland community. So it's very diverse. And depending on the physiognomy of those communities, you are going to have different ecosystem services. Obviously, mountains are most known for water supply and regulation, but they're also important, for example, in terms of carbon storage or spiritual and identity services. Overall, we could say that mountains are very important social ecological systems. Now, in this talk specifically, I'm going to focus on the alpine area of a mountain, and we can actually refer to the Alpine area as a sky island. So what is a sky island? A sky island is an island in the sky, obviously. An island means that it's an area that is isolated from the rest. And in this case, we would have a biogeographic isolation of the mountain tops or alpine areas in a sea of lower elevation ecosystems. Here you can see a profile of Mount Chimborazo in Ecuador that was uh, drawn by Humboldt, where you do see that the glacier area and the alpine area that's uh, comprised between the tree line and um, the snow line is actually um, isolated from the rest. Normally, you do find in the Alp, for example, in the Himalayas, a continuous belt of forests, but then when you reach the alpine area, you start seeing isolation from alpine area to alpine area. This is extremely important because in the end, it's going to result in a very small alpine area. And as you can see, it's a little bit less than 3% of the total land surface on Earth. And at the same time, you will see unique biodiversity, which means that we do have high richness, we do have high beta diversity, and we also have high endemisms. Now here, I want to make a very clear point. When I'm going to talk about the tropical alpine or alpine in general, I'm going to use it in a broad sense. And I'm not going to refer only to the climatically um, defined alpine. I'm also in going to include the subalpine grasslands. So everything that's above the timberline. For those of you that don't know, uh, the tree line or potential tree line is where the trees should climatically stop in the mountain. 
And the timber line is usually the lowering of that tree line due to human degradation. So these are often shrublands and grasslands that are very similar in physiognomy and composition to what's above the tree line. That is why I'm going to consider the two of them at the same time. Um, something also to consider is that because it's highly biodiverse and because um, the ecosystem services are very important in those areas, the alpine area is also extremely sensitive to environmental change. That means if there is degradation as in species, but also and foremost, what we're going to talk about in this talk, climate change. So this is the Chimborazo mountain, and I wanted to show you what the Chimborazo mountain looks like in real life. Right, so now we are going to focus specifically on the alpine areas or our sky islands. And here you can see in the world where those sky islands are distributed. So the whole red area corresponds to Sky Islands, so the broad alpine area. And you do see, um, for example, with the black dots, the main, not only um, the existing ranges, but the main ranges in the world. And because I am an expert of tropical alpine areas, specifically the northern Andean ones, I'm going to focus a little bit more on those systems. Then everything that I'm going to say uh, in, the, in, in my talk can also be applied to other tropical alpine areas without much adjustments. And it can also be applied to temperate and subtropical areas with a few adjustments. So please bear that in mind. Right, so our area of interest uh, is called the Andean Paramo. And it is part of the tropical and these biodiversity hotspots. As we all know, a hotspot is defined by its important species richness, but also its high endemism and sensitivity to environmental threat, meaning that it has a high rate of degradation. So in the map, you can see the tropical Andes here. And um, this map actually shows you the relative biodiversity values used to define key biodiversity areas. So when you find the red points, it means that these areas are particularly important. Overall, if you look at the Andes within South America, for example, the Andes hold about half of the total plant richness on the whole continent, which underlines the extreme importance of those ecosystems. Now, the Paramo itself focuses only on the northern part of the tropical Andes. And as you can see, it coincides with several um, um, red areas that we do have in the north. So in the map over there, you can see what the delimitation of the Andean Paramo is. So it covers four different countries. It's known as the richest region in the world in terms of tropical mountain biodiversity. It is also an extremely young system and its endemism at the species level for plants at least reaches about 70% of the total plant richness. So as you can see, it's quite a unique area. Here are a few landscapes just so we know what we're talking about. So because it covers four countries, I took a picture of each of the countries uh, that is representative of the kind of paramos that you find in those areas. So as we can see here in Peru, grassland dominated, quite steep. Then we go to Ecuador, where you can see that the humidity, the overall fog is actually way higher. So these are usually quite humid paramos, especially in the south and north. Then we go to Colombia, for example, in this area where you do see the wettest Paramo that they are. And as you can see, it's also grassland dominated, but it has a higher abundance of shrubs and giant rosettes. And finally, we are talking about the Venezuelan Paramo that are usually rosettes dominated. So there are relatively fewer grasslands and a higher abundance of shrublands and these big rosettes communities. Now, of course, when we talk about the Paramo, we also have to talk about the human intervention that takes place in those kind of landscapes. So contrary to other 
mountain and especially alpine environments, the northern Andes are not that degraded. You don't have millennial occupation of the area and activities in the area. The activities that take place uh, were relatively few and scarce until the um, Spanish colonization. And afterwards, they became more important and starting uh, paying an environmental toll on communities and ecosystems from the 50s onward. That means that the degradation is recent. It can be very impactful and something to keep in mind, but it's relatively recent, which means that restoration is somehow easier because you still have, for example, a native seed bank available. What kind of um, human observation do we have here? We have several activities related to the, the usual land use, such as agriculture and um, pasture of livestock. We also have, um, in a few, in, uh, in a small extent, uh, mining activities, as well as deforestation of the shrublands and relict forest, as well as plantations, for example, pine plantations. And there is an increasing demand for tourism associated especially with glaciers and water bodies. All of this obviously is leading to important environmental threats. There is an ongoing biodiversity loss that can be observed at uh, both the population, species, and community levels. At the same time, there is an affectation of the ecosystem processes and functions that leads to overall ecosystem service degradation. There is just an overall habitat degradation, destruction, fragmentation, overexploitation of the different ecosystems. Pollution tends to be a little bit more local uh, and depending on the activities that are uh, carried through. And finally, there is a high presence of alien species that um, take advantage of the very low seasonality, their low climatic seasonality in those areas to uh, just spread extremely rapidly. So here you can see landscape, for example, this is a paramo in Ecuador, where you can see um, crops directly uh, in, in, in the background. You do see that some areas are overgrazed because the paramo usually uh, looks yellow, as you could see in the different pictures. So when it looks green, it means that there is some overgrazing going on and some opportunistic species um, just spreading around. You can see the uh, pine plantations that are over there. Uh, you can suppose that there was some kind of deforestation going on. And this area is not particularly touristic, uh, but it's something that can obviously affect greatly the um, landscape. So this talk focuses on climate, one of the main environmental threats in mountains and especially in alpine areas. So alpine areas overall are classified as highly vulnerable by the IPCC, and um, they are predicted to undergo very drastic temperature and precipitation changes in the very near future. In this um, slide, you can see uh, different ecosystem, different alpine ecosystems and Arctic ecosystems. And you can see that the tropical alpine is actually one of uh, the, oh yeah, I have to find my pointer again, sorry about that. Um, yeah, the tropical alpine areas are some of the most affected, and some are predicted to drastic changes. Not necessarily all alpine areas are going to suffer drastic changes in precipitation, but, if you do not see a, an important change in rainfall, that change can actually come from other kinds of precipitation, such as fog. What is expected, so especially in tropical alpine mountains, is an increase in seasonality, so more dry months and at the same time wet months. And all of this obviously is combined with important glacial retreat and um, a change in duration of the snow cover in temperate areas. What kind of impacts can we expect from climate change in alpine areas overall? Right, so we were talking about the biotic responses to climate change and what to expect in alpine areas. 
So we have several types of responses. At the individual and population level, what is most common, obviously, is first to undergo a tolerance uh, phase. And this can lead to short-term acclimatization and long-term adaptation to climate change. In other words, it means that the individual is going to adapt to changing conditions, and those adaptations can um, main, be maintained in, um, over, over different generations. So this is what I'm showing you here. This is an example of the um, of an heat wave tolerance um, studies that shows how species are actually able to um, survive a heat wave and how they respond to it be, be, before any future climate change scenario and under a climate change scenario. What can also happen is distribution shifts. So it's very common to look at the species level and not only see what kind of adaptation is going on, but also if the species is able to move and actually track the either terms. So it's something that I'm currently working on a lot, and it shows how the whole populations of each species can actually go up in the mountain or go at least sideways. Here you can see this is a study in the Australian Alps that there is, for example, um, a, an important uh, shift in um, distribution of the alpine species upslope, but also downslope in some cases, because some species are going to track perhaps different kind of climatic conditions. Then we obviously have another level, which is the community level. So when we put all species together and we account for the adaptation and migration capacity, we end up with a change in community composition and community richness. All of this data that I'm showing you is past recent past data. It comes from different monitoring initiatives. So it's something that's already happening. I'm not even talking about predictions yet. So in this case, um, it shows on different European summits what is supposed to happen. And um, as we can see over the last century, there's been an increase in species richness that is related to the warming occurring on these areas. Then, I, as I previously mentioned, uh, we do have certain recomposition going on. So the community is going to undergo important changes in species composition. Some are gonna come, some are gonna go, and all of this is going to create novel ecosystems. The issue here is that it's not only a recomposition of native species, but you can obviously expect alien species coming up from lower elevations and just mixing and developing new ecological networks with the existing species. So here I'm showing you uh, what's happening on, on different Gloria sites and how you can, um, as you can see, there is a change uh, of um, 20 years between 94 and 2014, where you do see changes in species richness, but also the amount of colonization and the amount of decolonization happening over that time span. And something that I would like to insist on that is extremely important for management is the lags. All of these responses occur, but they just occur at different time scales. So it's very important when you want to manage something to know how fast each of these responses are occurring, how they are overlapping, and how to quantify the lags. This allows you to anticipate future changes. So this is a very simplified figure that only shows you the three main lags that you can expect. First, there is a lag in dispersal, so that would affect the species and community levels especially. Then there is a lag in establishment, so the species can um, appear somewhere, but it, that doesn't mean that it's going to establish right away. There might be a lot of times. And then finally, there is an extinction lag. And this lag depends on the tolerance and the adaptation capacity of the species, but also the strengths of the biotic interactions sorry, in the community. Right, so now that we talked a little bit about what has happened so far, I want to get into more details about predictions, because the idea is not only to see what already has happened, but to anticipate change to better manage biodiversity in those areas. 
So if we look at um, a population within a species, it has different features, obviously its growth rates, its reproduction rates, its migration rates that are going to affect its different responses, both in terms of adaptation and migration. So what could we expect from a given species? If the species has good um, adaptation capacity, but it doesn't have any migration capacity, it will probably crush over time because the climate is going to change and it will adapt and it will stretch as much as it can, but it cannot exactly follow the azotherms. So it is going to reduce its population. As you can see here, you have a difference between the gray and the green. The gray is past conditions and the green is future conditions. And it's what uh, is supposed to be expected uh, from the species as an, a biological response. So in this case, the species persists, but obviously it's losing a lot of fitness and it's not in its optimal conditions. Then we have the case of a species that is able to migrate, but that doesn't necessarily have very good adaptation capacity. In this case, you can see that the gray is left behind and the green is actually moving forward. This means that the species is going to follow the other terms, but it's not going to remain where it was originally. The best case scenario, and it's obviously the case of many alien species, we have an expansion. That's when the species is able both to migrate and adapt to new conditions. So it is going to maintain its current distribution range and at the same time is going also to move and track the ethotherms. Finally, if the species isn't able to adapt and isn't able to migrate, obviously it's going to go extirpated from the area, so local extinction. And on the longer term, and especially if it's an endemic species, it could actually go extinct. All of these are depending on the demographics and the population features, but it's also depending on the ecological niche in a sense that it depends on dispersal, on environmental conditions, and on the strengths of the biotic interactions. So when you know all of this, then you can use predictive models to anticipate the different changes that are going to occur. In my case, because I work a lot with uh, migration and uh, changes in community composition, I'm going to focus on the dispersal and the migration aspect of the response. So I'm not going to tackle here the adaptation capacity, but keep in mind that it's always something that you should include in any management strategy, obviously. So here I'm just showing you an example of uh, a very recent study that we did in the tropical alpine area where we do see the glacial retreat so as you can see you have the glacial here on this map and then you have the deglaciation zones so zone one would be very close to the glacier it's recently deglaciated while zone five for example it has um, a more historic de um, uh, deglaciation so in this case what we did and that's what i'm showing in this picture here is the changes in the community composition that depends on the movement of each of the populations. So we looked at the different zones and actually predicted how the population would actually change uh, spatially over time, because those kind of deglaciation areas are actually excellent study cases for um, space for time substitution. It means that on a very short scale, it's actually showing you what could happen in the future. Here we have another example um, that targets the species level. So if we move from the population level and scale it up to the species, we can predict the changes using species distribution models. And I'm sure that most of you are very familiar with this technique. What you do is you correlate the occurrence and absence points of a species in the landscape with environmental features. And using different climate change scenarios, you can then predict how the distribution of the species is going to change. But something that I want to make extremely clear at this point is that a regular species distribution model gives you that kind of results. Those results are only correlating the species with the environment. And obviously, it's flawed. I mean, it has some meaning, but it's not enough. 
what you need to add on top of this is species interactions and dispersal capacity. If you don't do that, you are most likely going to overpredict what is going on. And this is important for temperate mountains, but it's especially important for tropical mountains where you do not have that many um, changes in climatic conditions over a large latitudinal gradient, for example. So this is an example of uh, the Paramo area uh, in the tropical Alpine Andes. And we are comparing here the potential distribution of the species, so just regular species distribution model, and a new methodological advancement that would be B, in which we actually constrain the distribution of the species, including for dispersal and including for um, biotic interactions in, in the sense that we are doing joint SDFs, joint species distribution models. Once you have those very fine models, what you can do is track the progress of the species in the landscape depending on the different climate change scenarios. And here I want to show you a few examples of how you can actually improve your modeling capacity, including for the interactions and the dispersal capacity of species. So here we have three species that um, are distributed in the Ecuadorian Paramo. And we are predicting their changes between 2010 and 2000 and the end of the century. We have different scenarios here. First, let's focus on Gentianella Hercules. We do see a map that's all gray with um, a little yellow here and there. The little yellow is actually referring to the area that is predicted to be lost in the future. In this case, the species doesn't have any other color on the map. And that's um, and 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 that's that's obviously a big problem because it means that it will very likely go extinct over this period of time. Now, careful, we are not accounting for adaptation capacities, so we might be um, over predicting extinctions, but still, it is extremely worrisome. Then we have the second case scenario. Let's look at the species in the middle, Geranium sibaldioides, and this one, as you can see, has plenty of colors. So we do see a lot of yellow. That is uh, potentially what the species is losing over time. But we also do see a lot of black areas, which means that this is the area where the species is likely to maintain its distribution between 2010 and 2100. At the same time, we do see some colorful green red area uh, on, the, uh, on the verge of the black distribution. And this color actually means that the species is going to be able to colonize this area. So it's actually going to move in the landscape. And even though it loses a lot, it is also going to gain some new area. And finally, we do not see here any pink that is the potential distribution. And to understand what the potential distribution here is in this context, I'm going to talk about the third species. So if you look at Viola bangi, we do see some yellow, we do see some black, we do see a little green. All of these points are very scarce within the landscape. And we do see an abundance of pink color. The pink color refers to the area where the species could uh, actually establish because it has good environmental conditions for it at this stage, so at the end of the century but it's not occupied. It's not an area that is being colonized. It's not an area that is being maintained. And that is because the species haven't, hasn't been able to uh, disperse to these areas. So this is very interesting because you do have environmentally suitable areas that cannot be colonized due to dispersal limitations. So if you are going to manage those, those species, those different species, obviously in this case, uh, in the case of Gentianella, you have to consider ex situ conservation because it's very likely going to go extinct. For Geranium sibaldioides, you can move the species around quite a little bit, but you do not have any pink, which means that what you see is what you get. If you don't get any pink, you can't really move it out of its distribution because there is much, not much more to go, but it has a good continuous distribution, so we don't have to worry too much. 
And when you look at viola, then this one is obviously a tougher case because you could move it to the pink area, but it cannot move by itself. Scaling up all of this, then you can predict what is going to happen, putting all the species together. And this is the kind of maps that you obtain where you do see where you have species losses and species gains in such a region. So we are again focusing on the Paramo. And what we are seeing here is um, that you have some very clear upslope up up shift in distribution for the species. So for example, the red area means that this area is going to lose alpine species and the blue area means that it's going to gain alpine species. This is only alpine species, which means that obviously, you know, forest species can actually come up in elevation and fill in these new gaps left in the red area. But it is, it is very interesting because it means that what we already see in terms of um, uh, increase of species richness on mountaintops is going to continue and the models is, are also predicting the same thing. So we are going to see richness gains in the upper parts of the mountains and the richness losses of alpine species in the lower parts. This is a little bit worrisome obviously because these very important richness gains that happen uh, in at high elevations are going to uh, be made to the detriment of the native species that are adapted to these very, very specific conditions. And it can also mean that there will be an uprise in the alien species that will complement these new ecosystems. This is a little map, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but I think it's also important to take into account uh, for management. When you look at um, recent distribution changes, I think it is primordial to not only look at those changes on the very short term but also see if the species that you see actually remain within their past climatic refugia that means that those species for example during the last glaciation so the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago were already most likely distributed in the same area and are maintaining their distribution within this climatic refugia if the species is actually able to stay in the same place for about 20,000 years, it obviously means that there is an importance in protecting this specific area where you do have environmental stability, hence um, species remaining there for a long time. If on the contrary, you have species that are coming out of their refugia all the time and they are just moving around, it probably means that these species are have to rely on their migration capacity, but the, there is little room for adaptation. So in this case, what I'm showing on this map is areas, for example, in the dark green, where you do have a lot of refugia. And that means where the species are actually staying within their comfort zone over the long term. And finally, I'm going to talk briefly about the community level. So we already saw that there was some potential increase in species richness towards higher elevations. But then we could also look at the community itself and see if there is any um, change that is supposed to be underway. So something very important when you do a community model, you could do it in different ways. Before, um, I mean, in recent decades, when people were doing community models, what they did was treat a community as a species or as a unit, and same as a species distribution model, they would relate, they would correlate the, the distribution of the community or ecosystem to specific environmental features, and then predict changes in those features, in, in those features, hence communities over time. This is an example in Catalonia where you do see the shrinkage of this uh, meadow community in the Alpine area. Now, I want you to be very, very careful with this. And instead of just treating a community as a species, it makes sense to include all of the species in the community, see how they in independently react to climate change. And then on top of this, I expect to add different constraints that are actually going to form macro communities. So it's not only 
predicting the species and putting them together, but it's adding new constraints, for example, richness constraints and assembly rules. So in this case, you are putting again the dispersal capacity, the species interactions on top of your individual models, and you are constraining the whole thing by the assembly rules and the macroecological constraints or richness constraints. And this gives you this kind of results. So this is an example in Ecuador where we can see the different sky islands here uh, of the very higher most communities in the Ecuadorian mountains. And you do see uh, on the map on the right, the composition changes that are expected to happen on each of these sky islands. So it is not only richness, it is basically how many species are going to get out of this community and how many species are going to come into this community. And this is only alpine species. So again, be very careful with everything that's coming from below. And it shows us, for example, in this case, that certain areas such as northern Ecuador that are mostly blue are going to undergo drastic composition changes, whereas the central Ecuadorian paramo are going to suffer a little bit less. So this is what I wanted to show you in terms of potential predictions. And now let's dive very briefly in how those predictions can actually help us um, manage the biodiversity in terms of species and the ecosystems and how we can actually go further than this and not only preserve, but also obviously restore. So those kind of predictions help us anticipate biodiversity loss at the different levels. It shows us which species or which ecosystems are prioritary, which ones are actually deserving of urgent management strategies and which ones are actually able to withstand a little bit more. It can also help predict novel threats. And I'm putting on this picture, uh, um, the, this is actually on the post-glacial chrono sequence that I showed you before in, in the tropical alpine uh, paramo where we do see the glacier dressed right over there. And we do see that the first species colonizing is actually an invasive species. So you can use those kind of models at the different uh, stage or scales or whatever you think is it worth applying it to, to see how invasive species are actually going to migrate also in the landscape. And obviously the good thing is whenever you predict uh, climate change impacts, so then you can include that into your protected area management because you do have an idea of the gradients that you have to cover in the landscape to make sure that you keep your conservation goals. Now for restoration itself, um, we can look at it from different standpoints. So as we all know, when we look at restoration, we need a reference state, but the problem is when we are talking about climate change, it's very difficult to actually identify that reference state. Are we supposed to say things uh, to, to expect things to remain the same? Or are we supposed to change over time? What would be the reference state under a climate change scenario? It's something that needs to be accounted for because restoration is usually a long-term process. And of course, if we are looking at it uh, over a few years, then you know we could probably say climate change is not going to have such an important impact. But if we are looking at the effects of restoration on the longer term, then definitely we have to incorporate this aspect, even if it's only a decade. So in this case, those kind of predictions can actually help you simulate biodiversity scenarios. So we are going to define the reference state that we want in the future, depending on the different models, again, at the different scales. And then we have actually a target to move towards to. At the same time, it gives us uh, some very uh, important insight on the ecological strategy that we could follow, because we have to define what we are aiming towards, but we also have to define how to get there. And using those kind of models, you can actually simulate different kind of responses with or without different treatments. And something else that is also very key is that those kind of models can help you promote the use of different native species for your different restoration endeavors. For example, it can tell you which pioneer species to use and what its response is going to be. 
using this pioneer species, for example, to start an early restoration, then you can build your community around it. You could favor keystone native species, and you could also help the vulnerable species that are predicted to go extirpated or locally extinct on the short to mid term. And um, I think I don't have that much time, unfortunately, so I'm going to skip my example. Sorry about that. And I'm going to go directly to the last slide um, that goes into a little bit of more depth regarding the restoration options, building on the novel techniques that are now available to us in terms of ecological modeling. So the new models that are getting developed today, and that will be extremely insightful for restoration, are going to be an integration of not only the structure, so the biodiversity levels in the classical sense, but also the functional diversity and the processes that are associated to that. We also see new models that are able to integrate different scales. So it could be different temporal and spatial scales, and that also account for different compartments in the community. So we could see, for example, it's something that we are doing in the tropical alpine. We are looking at the community above ground and we are starting to look at the community below ground and see how these two interact. And this can be explained, but the better thing is that it can be explained and then used to predict what's going to happen in the future. It can help you combine different environmental threats. And for example, again, for the tropical alpine Andes, we are actually um, working on the red list of ecosystems right now, trying to combine all of this and including the predictions into those kind of assessments. The models are always becoming a little bit finer. So obviously it becomes finer where you have data availability and where you're working at a scale where it actually permits, which is usually the case for restoration. And the new models are accounting for the different lags. And it's something that is extremely important if we want to help our restoration initiatives. And finally, the better models should always include a social ecological perspective. So the examples that I showed you, because we do have relatively few um, or little human pressure in those kind of ecosystems, it's it could be okay not to be accounting for human in, um, endeavors. But if you are in an area where you do have active management, when it's not like the land management, when you are actually maintaining those systems, then you need to include those dynamics into future models to then put the restoration initiative on top on the existing um, activities. And with this, um, I thank you for your attention. Wow, thank you so much, Gwendolyn. That was such a fantastic overview of your research and congratulations on this important work. We have quite a few questions and since we are a little short on time, I wanna aggregate a couple of them. And there were a few that came in that were asking about uh, in your simulations, how you dealt with factors besides climate. So um, for instance, Tim asked about um, biotic interactions. I'll read you a few questions and then I'll let you uh, on a similar topic and then let you respond. Uh, he, Timothy Lewis asked, do you know of any of examples where the plant distribution has expanded due to thermal tolerance, but the distribution of herbivores that feed on the plant has not expanded thermal intolerance resulting in the plant becoming a nuisance species, similar to invasive species spreading due to a lack of herbivory. So that's that biotic interaction playing into projections. Um, and then Angie Arau asked, did the species distribution models in your uh, paper account for current and potential future land use, human disturbance? And there was one more, this is from Anita, um, who asked about uh, grazing management uh, and wildlife and how that played into the models. Okay, so I'm just gonna go over the first question um, about biotic interactions. You can actually include biotic inter uh, interactions in, in your models, but you can do it different ways. 
you can add it on top of the model as a constraint. So you can, for example, first predict the distribution change in the species, and then on top of it, put the co-occurrence patterns to actually see and constrain the distribution of the species depending on the second species. Or what you can do, and what most people do these days, is do a joint distribution models. So you actually weigh your distribution model depending on the other species when you are actually doing the model. So it allows for a much finer prediction of what's happening. And it can include trends that are going the same way or the opposite way. So you could actually have some species that increase the distribution and that are being weighted down by the others that do not increase the distribution or even reduce them. So there are several techniques to do that. And depending on the scale of your model, if it's a fine population model or if it's a species model or if it's a community model, then you can add those weights in different ways. But yeah, you most certainly want to do that to make sure that you have a more realistic overview of what's going on. Second question about the land use. So in this, in the cases that I showed you, um, and I'm sorry if I was rushing uh, a little bit in the end, I did not include land use directly into those models. And I did not include land use uh, because I didn't have any land use model at uh, my disposal at this point. I still don't, but I'm working on it uh, currently to make sure that I can actually not only predict how the species disperse depending on the environmental features. So you could just put the land cover uh, below your distribution, for example, that would already help. But the problem is um, you need a dynamic land cover and not a static land cover. And when you need, when you have a dynamic land cover and you want to predict how the dynamics are going to change into the future, you do, you do need land use trends that are going to be predicted and that depend on socioeconomic scenarios. These are a little bit difficult to build. And sometimes, I mean, most of the time they do assume a lot that, for example, there will be a national trend in agriculture or grazing and it's often not the case so you do need regional or local information to actually build clear trends of what is going to happen in the future and then you build your species distribution model or your community model accounting for the land use directly again you can include it into the model itself or you can use it as a constraint after you actually build the model but it's something that requires a lot of data so we are currently working for the Northern Andes on the land use model to include it into our future predictions. Mm. And I forgot about the third one. <laughs> Could you please remind me where the third one was? Um, so we talked about biotic interactions and land use. I think we covered that. And I want to move on uh, one more comment about the inputs to the model and considerations. I'll ask you a quick question and then we'll be out of time. So there was an observation from Marie, who's in the northwestern part of the United States, that alpine communities in her area were really harmed last year by a really significant heat event that occurred mm. in the early part of the summer. There was a ton mm. of snow that winter, but then it melted really quickly, really early because it was so hot in the spring. And of course, that's becoming more frequent. So Many of the alpine plants on the south and west facing slopes were burned, it didn't recover. And so in these types of models where you're building in climate variables, another important complexity to think about is um, those uh, extreme climatic events in addition you know, to the means. So I just Absolutely. wanted to share that comment and ask you one quick question and then we'll be out of time. But since we are so close to the end, I'll just thank everyone first for participating if you need to drop off. And um, I put some information in the chat. We'll be releasing the full schedule of events for the full 2023 calendar year in early January. We're staying with Fridays, third Friday of the month. We may adjust the time slightly. And um, there's information about how to reach me or Emanuela, as well as to join CEM. And so just a final question while we're on this topic and thinking about distribution models, were there species that you could not model um, due to poor predictive capabilities from, you know, range, map, climate relations? Yeah, absolutely. Just one very, very quick point about your last comment. It's very oh, yeah. important to 
to um, add those kind of, um, of, of events into your models. So just stochastic responses or responses to extreme events. And depending on the scale, the finer the scale, the easier it gets to actually include realistic predictions. So for example, there's going to be a heat wave and my plants are going to respond this way. When you are scaling this up, then it becomes a little bit more difficult because every time you include stochastic events, then obviously it's going to create some kind of error um, in certain responses. And you have to be able to interpret and really understand if those errors are, are meaningful or not. Now, regarding um, what, please, please. what you just said. Yes, <laughs> yes, sorry, can you please? So the, the question was about whether there were, oh, you know, you included a huge number of species, 660. Oh, yeah, yeah, if you couldn't, yes, okay, okay. Were there it, some sorry. you couldn't include because yes. of lack so, of predictive capability? Definitely. Definitely. You do need to have good presence and absence data. Um, I would not recommend if you can avoid doing models only based on presence data, that's better. I mean, always defining the environmental niche using both presence and absence data is better than only presence. Data. So it's something to keep in mind. And then obviously the model fit isn't good, then you can't use those predictions. Yeah. So in our case, obviously we had a very big species goal. And um, we set several thresholds of model quality. And if the species didn't respond well and, and were, had predictions below the thresholds, uh, obviously we didn't take them into account. And those thresholds were defined on the test and not on the AUC that can be over generous in predictions. Yeah. Wow, fantastic. Thank you so much. We'll have to call it now since we're already a little past the hour. I wanted to share there was a lot of uh, thank yous in the chat. Sandra Gonzalez says, very interesting and useful presentation. Very important for practitioners of restoration. Um, so we're all very grateful that you uh, took time out of your travel schedule. Uh, you know, apologies for the fact that you had connectivity issues is always, you know, stressful to be trying to do this type of event. But uh, when the video posts, we will edit out those um, segments so it is seamless. And okay. um, for those <laughs> well, thank of, you very much. For those of you participating, we appreciate that you're with us uh, on this uh, webinar series journey. We're excited for next year. We hope you'll you'll join next year and please reach out. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll leave the line open for a few more minutes so we can respond in the chat um, and uh, give you a chance if you need to pull any information from the chat. Thank you, Gwendolyn. And I thank, thank you, Kara. Thank you, everyone. And please feel free to contact me if you have any further questions.